am I frustrated or resentful that like I had to write this book instead of writing the like sexy sci-fi space opera about cats that I would have been preferring to write like (laughs) no because this book I just found in this experience just was so rich and mind expanding that like you know this is something that blindness has given me is is this path to explore and like a path that I never would have thought about otherwise but that is like incredibly complicated and confusing and surprising and funny and rich and so I'm grateful to yeah. to my uh, fucked up DNA for leading me here. Andrew Leland, welcome to this see-through podcast. Hey, thanks Lance. Happy to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. I've been reading your book, you know, The Country of the Blind, a memoir at the end of sight. I'm holding it up oh, sweet. to the camera right now. I will be honest, I'm, I haven't read the entire book. Oh, for shame. Um, this interview is over. <laughs> no, just kidding. That's fine. It's a long ass book. I understand. But I totally plan to and intend to and will finish your book. And yeah, the reason why I'm so excited to talk to you is, you know, not because you're some established new author, but the inner dialogue and the voice that you write and resonates with me mm. in the sense that like it's relatable and I feel like you're almost inside of my mind. <laughs> and it all, it almost too, like before this interview, I was like, I wonder what Andrew is going to be thinking while doing this interview because I'm reading your book and I kind of feel like I kind of know that you're like an analytical type of guy. Mm. So I'm like, what's he thinking right now? It's like, <laughs> you know, like how, how would he decipher this this experience into his writing, you know, mm. if this was part of your book and whatnot. Mm. Um, so I, I'm kind of like, oh, I hope I, I hope I'm, uh, you know, stimulating, a, <laughs> you know, a good conversation and I'm, you know, asking good questions. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited to talk to you, but, uh, you know, the classic intro, how about before we start diving deep yeah. into the weeds on things, how about we just get like a classic, you know, intro for the people who are uh, new to you? Yeah. Well, no. And I want to say like, uh, I think, I think if I did write something about you, you'd be happy with what I got. I mean, from what I've heard from your podcast, I think you do a really good job of like, and not just a good job, but like, I think, I think you're filling a space that doesn't really exist as far as I've seen in terms of like blindness podcasts or like disability podcasts where you're kind of like chewing on big cultural questions that a lot of folks don't engage with. I think, um, like, I think there's a lot of like, you know, you're blind. What are like the top three iPhone apps that you should download. Um, but like not as many people engaging in like the sort of emotional and, and, but also like pop cultural aspects of it. Uh, so, you know, I'm psyched to be here and, uh, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm interested to talk to you too. Um, in terms of the, the classic intro, yeah, I've got this book that just came out last month and I'm currently in the middle of just like promoting the hell out of it. Uh, which is really fun, um, doing bookstore events and interviews and trying to write about blindness and disability professionally where I, uh, you know, in addition to the book, while I was writing the book, I also started to write, um, magazine features and, and doing some podcast radio stuff that's connected to blindness, but also just other disabilities and, um, similar to you, you know, like thinking about like the ways that disability and, and culture kind of intersect and not just culture, but like politics and history and, um, <clears throat> technology. So right now that's what I'm trying to do going forward is, is really try to like be a journalist on that beat. Um, while also, you know, c- coming from my own perspective as a, somebody who is blind and getting blinder, you know, I've got RP, I was diagnosed, um, as a teenager and it's been pretty classic, uh, as far as what my doctors have told me in terms of the progression, you know, there are people who progress slower people who progress faster you know I like the prognosis I got was like it'll be slow until middle age and then it'll speed up and you know we can talk a little bit about how that prognosis has been changed a little bit more recently from my doctor but um but yeah you know like right now I'm 42 and I've got I think probably like seven degrees or something like that of central vision um you know so I use a white cane I use a screen reader on my computer or my phone Um, but I also have those seven degrees, you know, and I'm using them to, you know, still like, don't always turn on audio description if I'm watching a movie and, um, like, you know, my, on my computer, I always use the screen reader, but for some reason on my phone, like magnification is still doing me right for the most part, you know, so I'm not always using the screen reader there. And I'm really like in this in between space and that's what a lot of the book is about. Um, but yeah, I live in Western mass 
got a lovely wife, a lovely son. I sometimes teach at universities, writing programs or, you know, journalism programs. Um, uh, yeah, I'm happy to tell you more, but that's the basic facts of my existence. I ate some chicken for lunch. <laughs> what kind of chicken? How'd you cook it? Last night I grilled it and then today it went into a salad. Right up. My wife would like to hear yeah, that. Great use of leftovers, you know? <laughs> But yeah, that's a great intro. And yeah, you're a very well-rounded um, man. And uh, you mentioned the in-between. Yeah. You know, and that's that's like essentially what the see-through podcast is. It's like, or at least from my perspective as the host, is like the in-between. Mm-hmm. And I interview people who, you know, are on one end of the spectrum. And then I have people like me who are on the other end who are kind of in the beginning phases, mm-hmm. you know. Like I haven't ventured into the legally blind realm Mm -hmm, yet, mm -hmm. you know, but I have a diminished field of vision Mm -hmm. and my night vision is affected and all that. So it kind of puts me at, as a host sometimes, like I, I'm like, and I've talked about this in past episodes where sometimes I'm like, I have a, a lot of like imposter syndrome, you know, where I'm like, should I be the one hosting Mm. this podcast? Should I be the one talking about Mm. this? Should I be the one facilitating these conversations? Mm. And then, you know, but after a while, like, I've kind of realized that, yeah, a hundred percent, I should be the one doing these, these conversations. And if anyone has a problem with like me advocating and, and interviewing people and shining a spotlight on people from, you know, the disability community, that's kind of a strange perspective to have. And, and, and to be, to be honest, I've never heard anyone have a problem with it. It's all, it was all in my mind probably for the most part. Yeah. But you know, you the voice you write <clears throat> with in your book is kind of, you t- kind of talk, talk a lot about that kind of, um, feeling like a fraud, yeah. you know, as, as your vision was, was kind of diminishing. Yeah. In fact, you start your book with, um, I'm, I'm going blind as I write this. It sounds, uh, more dramatic than it is. Yeah. You know, so it's like, what a way to start a book for one, but I would, I would like for you to kind of elaborate on, you know, that inner voice and maybe how it drives your writing, but also how it's driven your, um, life. I'm so glad that you asked that question. And I think you're right. I think you should be the host of this show. Um, and, and, you know, it's tricky. Like I've had other, I've done other interviews for this book where, the, 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 the interviewer has said to me like, well, so you say you're at the end of sight, you know, the title is the country of the blind, a memoir at the end of sight. But I just saw you like looking around the screen and like, you're not really at the end of sight, right? Cause you're still using your eyes. And like, it's, it just comes up again and again. And like, there's a scene in the book where, um, I was walking down the street. This is like a you know thing that happened to me, like right around the time I started writing. And, uh, I had my white cane and, and when I'm in a hurry, that's when, and this was, this was probably like you know, six years ago now or something. Um, when I, back then in particular, when I was in a hurry, the cane really became useful because I would just like, you know, be much less likely to see something. And I walked by this guy, this is on the street in Manhattan and and he, I kind of lock eyes with him for a second and I can see there's like something nasty in his face. And he's like, you can Mm -hmm. see. And it was like such a balloon bursting moment. Cause like, you know, I just sort of like imagine people thinking that about me so many times and then to just like hear it was both like, extra upsetting, but also kind of a relief in a way that I was like, okay, this is something that people are confused about and think, and, and, um, you know, so that's all to say that like, I would, I sort of had an idea in my head that writing the book would solve some of those in inner, uh, conversations that I have. And it hasn't totally, like, it's still something that I think about, but I have gotten a lot more comfortable with not just the idea of me as like a, narrator, you know, in the same way that you're a host of like, you know, like, like exploring the country of the blind, but, Mm -hmm. um, but also accepting myself as somebody who is blind. And even as I have, you know, these seven degrees of, of central vision and the, the most succinct way I could just explain it is that it's crucial to accept blindness because if you don't then you're in denial and then you're going to be hosed like so, so just like to give you a specific example um i mean i when i first started writing the book i read print 
um, without magnification. And yeah, I was struggling with it. I don't think I was fully conscious of how much I was struggling with it, but like as a writer, you know, being able to read lots of books quickly is a really important skill, right? Or lots of books yeah, slowly. Definitely. You just, you know, you got to read a lot of books and then the pandemic happened and I was like, got freaked out momentarily about this is this is like a way longer version of the story than you need. But like, I kind of had this like panicky moment. I feel like you'll appreciate it though. I had a panicky moment where I was like, the supply chains in China are going to shut down. And like, I've got to buy this video magnifier that I was like eyeing, but I was like, I don't really need to know if I need that. And then I bought it. And then that basically I just like, you know, I started writing the book in the end of 2019 and really like over the course of the three years that it took me to write the book, I just, there was this like gradual process of like realizing how difficult reading print was and how much I was struggling to do it. But there was still always this ambiguity where I was like, but I totally could, like, I'm still sort of a faker. Like if I really had to, I could just do it. And then I started practicing using a screen reader. And, and when I started doing that, it really just felt like, you know, you get a gym membership and you're like, I guess I'm going to go to the gym, you know, cause I'm paying for this gym membership. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to turn it on. And like, it made my computer seem like it had come from another planet all of a sudden, you know, and like all the commands were weird. And I was like, end up in, you know, it was like when you first start using a computer, it was sort of that experience all over again. But I just like was a good boy scout about it. And like every week would just be like, okay, like for whatever, even if it's just like 15 minutes a week, I just need to like turn it on and like play with it. And then that turned into like an hour a week, you know, and then like by at a certain point, I just it, it was easier and I was leaving it on more. And then I was like, oh, man, this is making my life so much easier. And um, and then I really realized that by, by the end of the book, uh, by the end, by the end of the revision process, when I was really having to just like reread these passages over and over again and like go through my editor's notes, if I hadn't been able to listen to that and I hadn't figured out how to use a screen reader, like I don't think I would have hit my deadline and I might've had to just like punt on my book deal because I just it, like my eyes were getting tired so much more quickly. And, and so I say all that just as an example of like, if I had said to myself like, well, I can still see the, the words on the page or like, I can still like even do like large print in on a Kindle. Like, I don't need this. I would have, I would have been doing myself such a disservice. And so like to, to try to like, be respectful to real blind people and say like, well, I have nothing to do with that. I'm just going to keep living my sighted life. Like it's to actually to like ruin my own life, you know? And so that was like a real revelation yeah. that both was something that I was trying to document in the book that I think the book explores, but also was just in my experience of writing it was like the imposter syndrome is not doing anybody any favors. There's no blind people who are like winning now because I denied myself, you know, blindness <laughs> and, and, you know, and I, I'm, and, you know, and, and the screen reader is just one of many examples I could point to of like things that feel weird. And like, I am an imposter, like the cane is the big one, right? Like, what am I doing carrying this like thing that I don't need that makes everybody treat me differently. But in the long term, like it's going to save me from kicking a dog, like hip checking a toddler, falling off a curb and like, get me yeah. you know, like live, you know, to, to, to paraphrase the NFB, the national federation of the blind slogan, you like live the life I want. Like it really is this sort of like independent, uh, path to independence or, or key to independence. So I really drank the Kool-Aid with that. And, um, that's a really powerful idea that again, I have, and I had the revelation and then I wake up the next day and I have to sort of have it all over again. it's like, it's really an ongoing practice. Yeah. It's definitely an ongoing practice, especially when, you know, there's so many deferring opinions and voices, you know, some, somebody has the opposite viewpoint of you and they're going to be vocal about it. Yeah. And then somebody will be vocal about the same opinion as you. So you're like, Oh, that, Oh, I am right. Oh, I am wrong. <laughs> and then you, but at, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm, as the older I get, the more comfortable I get feeling, you know, that's more secure with my own viewpoints mm -hmm. and, how I view it. And if someone wants to think that, whatever, it doesn't affect me. And I, I you know, I got to, you know, just kind of be my own voice, my own role model, essentially. And, you know, kind of connect with other people who are going to, you know, inspire me and also teach me something, mm -hmm. you know, I, I feel like, you know, that's all it really is. So, you know, the whole, like, if you're not completely blind and you sh shouldn't, you call, you shouldn't call yourself blind, mm -hmm. you know, argument. It's like you said, who does that benefit? Yeah. You know, cause like <clears throat> the more people in a community, the more, you know, advocacy that's going to happen, the more, you know, change that's going to positive change that's going to happen to, to that community as a whole. Mm -hmm. So it's like everyone benefits from it. Whereas, you know, if you make it some club, 
you know, oh, are you, are you blind enough to be in my club? Yeah. Then it's, then you're, you're, what, what message does that send? And then also it, what message does that send to people like me in the beginning phases in the sense, like you don't belong in the sighted world, but you also don't belong here either. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, well, I guess I'm just a lost soul kind of roaming this like white abyss, <laughs> you know, kind of which, which direction do I go? Yeah. Who, what do I identify as? And all these, these things. So I have my own ideology, I have my own viewpoints and, and they're kind of my true Norse and how I, how I want to kind of progress and age into my RP, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And, and I've got to the point now where I hear a, a, a take on something and I'm like, I get why they had that take, but I'm like, but I'm also like, that doesn't benefit me. So I'm just going to disregard that. Or I, that doesn't align with how I view it. So I'm just, you know, going to disregard that. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. But yeah, it's taken a lot of effort on my end. You know, I've been doing this podcast for about three years and, you know, when I started, I had, you know, my imposter syndrome was a lot stronger, Mm. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the power Um, of writing and podcasting. I think I would include in that category of like, you know, of, of really engaging with ideas directly and not just, you know, I think it's such a, interesting experience to have this like soup of conflicting thoughts and impressions in your mind. And it's really only once you either start talking about it and not just talking about it, but like, you know, sharing your thoughts with other people and and being in conversation. And I think, I think for me writing the book is, it sounds like the book for me and the podcast for you are very similar projects in this way where it's like, there's this big, overwhelming, scary, confusing, complicated cloud And it's like, well, okay, Mm -hmm. let's start chipping away at it. And like over the course of three years, you know, that's, that's the same sort of block of time that sounds like you and I have both been on this like parallel paths of like, where, let's map out the territory. Let's like, you know, figure out some contours here. And like it really over time, it does demystify it. And, um, so there's like two things it it demystifies it, right. Cause you're like talking to all these people and you're getting a sense of the landscape, but it also, um, I think like helps you figure out your place in it. I don't know if that's been your experience, but that was the big thing for me is like, I not only wanted to understand the whole terrain, but I wanted to sort of be like, where do I fit in here? And I feel like when you're in conversation in that way, you can get that. And then, and then ideally, I think in both of our cases, just to extend this parallel track, like, you know, you have this thing that you can share with the world and hopefully it helps other people figure out their place in it. And, and sometimes it means they push back against it and they say like, no, that's not me. But, but ideally it's like, it starts that conversation. Oh, a thousand percent, you know, you know, we're both putting ourselves out there. So we're putting ourselves out there for scrutiny, you know, and that's going to happen. How many books are out there? How many podcasts are out there? Is it really that big of a deal? You know, in the sense of like, really, like I shouldn't have this voice or you shouldn't write this book. It's like, who says, Yeah. you yeah. know, it, it's uh silly to think like that. And I think you think similar to me. I mean, you touch on a lot of this in the book in terms of, you know, it's, you know, the book's called The Country of the Blind, but you also talk about the disability community as a mm. whole because, you know, the reason I want to bring that up is because on, you know, the See Through podcast, I talk to mainly people with visual impairments or, or living with blindness. Um, but I also talk to anyone in the disability community as well because I see, I'm trying to see like the bigger picture of it all, mm. you know, and how we all kind of connect into one thing. Yeah. And there's a lot of similarities in the sense of how someone with, you know, someone not living with, you know, blindness, you know, has mentally adapted to their disability Mm -hmm. and faces similar, you know, obstacles and whatnot. Um, Whereas on the opposite side of that, there's people who are hyper focused on their specific, you know, disability. Like, for example, uh, retinitis pigmentosa, you know, I'm a big advocate for RP and talking about RP, but at the same time, I don't want it to be like the only thing I think about Mm. and talk about Mm -hmm. and the only community I want to reach. I don't want to only reach the RP community. That'd be silly. Like what's the difference between being blind from RP and being blind from star guards? It's, Mm. you know, it's like, but somehow I feel like people get really hung up on like the specifics Mm -hmm. of the name of the eye disease or whatever Mm -hmm. call cause, you know, the blindness and they lose sight of the bigger picture. Um, and then, and then it extends beyond that from blindness as a whole to just the disability community as a whole. What has been your kind of 
process of understanding that, because you, you write about it a lot in your book in terms of just like ableism as a whole, you know, accessibility as a whole. Yeah. When did it click for you that it was like, you know, you're you're more than just RP mm. and you're also more than just blindness. Mm. You're you're a part of the larger disability community. Yeah, that's such a good question. I mean, I think to start, I love that idea that you brought up about the sort of hyper partisan like I'm an RP guy, not a Stargard guy. And like well, RP guys are yeah, over yeah. here and we have our own listserv or whatever, mm-hmm. you know? And I think in some ways that's a really medical model. And one of the, like the first really powerful ideas that I encountered in reading about disability and like, you know, there's this whole kind of growing academic field of disability studies, you know, where you have like, it's, it's pretty new, you know, I think it really only took off in the nineties, but like, there's some really interesting books out there by, professors who really like are you know, scholars who are devoting their lives to studying disability in that way. And um, one of the, like, the really interesting ideas that is really important and influential in that world is, is this idea of the social model of disability. I don't know if that's something you've encountered. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. So like for me, like when you think about disability in terms of the social model, which is to say like, you know, it's the medical model, you know, is the sort of like, the, the, the villain uh, of, of the social model, right? So like the medical model is like something's wrong with your body, so you're disabled. The social model is like the world is not built to accommodate your disability. And so it's like the sort of like ableist society that disables you. And it's like a, yeah. a social construction rather than like a, a physical one. And, you know, I feel like if you're thinking about your disability only in, in, the, in terms of the medical model, you end up with those sort of narrow, like hyper- disease oriented partisan things where it's like we're all focused on a cure like the the the, the disease is the bad thing and yeah so um so therefore like i'm probably only should talk to people with rp because they only they un- understand this experience and i think when you start to think of it more socially then you get then the then the, the, the lens widens a bit and it's like well actually like blind people no matter whether they're low vision or totally blind or star guards or rp like they all share uh, a set of concerns that brings us together. Right. And then, so then you start to have like organizations like, you know, the, the AFB, the American foundation for the blind or, or the NFB, the national federation for the blind, you know, all these like consumer groups, right. Or like, like big, big, big tent. And then, but then even beyond that, you know, you're asking about sort of other disabilities. And I think like the, the, the further back you go, I think the more kind of generous you have to be in having compassion for people whose experience is different than yours. Um, you know, which is like, I think the goal of any kind of political consciousness is like, you know, you're comfortable in your situation or you have a certain set of resources. How can you open your mind and heart and pocketbook and energy to people who don't have what you have? Right. And I think that like, yeah, that comes up a lot in cross disability solidarity. Cause it's sort of like, well, the blind people got what we need, right? Like we got this tax break or we got this, uh, legislation, you know, if, if you, it's wild, if you look at the tax code, like blind people have a special separate, um, category. Like if you're deaf, uh, and you're looking for, uh, uh, social security, uh, disability insurance like you're gonna you get less per month than you do if you're blind and that's a result of Mm -hmm. like really smart and vocal activists uh in the blind community advocating for that and like on the one hand like that's cool like badasses in the nfb like going back to the 1940s were pushing it and now we have a tax code that benefits blind people on the other hand if you're looking at it from a disability solidarity perspective like that's kind of messed up right um like why would a person in a wheelchair uh, need less need fewer resources right it's not like their equipment is any less expensive to replace or something like that you know and there are arguments that have been made that like blindness because it requires this sort of like training as opposed to like somebody with a mobility disability who might not need like you know braille instruction and like techniques of daily living instruction Mm -hmm. all the things you see like in a blindness vocational rehab context but still, I just I, it doesn't make sense to me. And and there's so in the book, especially in the later chapters that you will get to, uh, there is a lot of uh, I get into some of that history of like when the ADA was being, you know, when the ADA was first being drafted and different disability groups were kind of figuring out what it should include. The NFB, which was like and still is the sort of like largest uh, blindness sort of activist consumer organization 
were actually against certain parts of it. And, and part of it had to do with this fear and resistance to being lumped in with other disability groups. And, Mm -hmm. um, so I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think my answer to your question is that it's really important to have these kind of cross disability alliances and solidarities, but I think it requires the same kind of compassion and like looking beyond your own disability to consider other people's, you know, I think, I think, I think there's a lot of ableism within disability communities, which I think comes as a surprise to people, right? Cause it's like, there's no yeah. racist people of color. There's no ableist disabled people. And like, actually there totally are. Um, <laughs> and so that was another wild kind of revelation I had in writing the book was like really investigating the kind of contradictions and disagreements as much as like the kumbaya, like, you know, together we will fight. Yeah. It's almost like if there's like a Venn diagram of like the medical and social you know, I kind of, I'm, I'm typically usually like in, in like the middle and sometimes I'll be in the more, I'll find myself on a day I'll, I feel more in the medical yeah. and then I find myself more into the social side and it kind of changes. And, you know, there's a lot of eye rolling these days with advocacy in the sense of, oh, how annoying they're being advocates, you know, but it's like without the advocacy, without the people, the quote unquote annoying people who are pushing you to accommodate them, mm-hmm. then those changes don't happen. Mm. So it's kind of like a, a necessary annoyance to some people yeah. to benefit the others. And um, yeah, I, I think some people just th- think things are good as is. Mm. And there is a lot of great things as is right now, but it's like in terms of changing and uh, making things, improving things, basically. It's like, all right, well, it's going to be a, a continuous process. It's a never ending process. Yeah. So like uh, in terms of advocacy and like activists yeah. and disability activists, you know, I think the political climate right now is very us versus them. Mm. And what annoys me is, is uh, it's almost like if you're a disability advocate for like disability rights you get grouped in with you know you're far left or you're Mm -hmm. super progressive and only super progressive far left people are fighting for Mm -hmm. rights and then you know where it's like disability has it's not really affiliated with any like specific political party and and just like the blind community has you know a plethora of different perspectives and people there there's blind republicans blind democrats of course yeah you know it's like there's you know so it's kind of silly to think that oh if you're if you're basically not okay with how things are as is then you must be a progressive liberal right (laughs) and and i just and and it's just like i i kind of get frustrated by that yeah in the sense like you can't like challenge or say things can improve um in that on that front yeah there's a great quote i ran across by a guy who gets called like the godfather of the organized blind movement newell perry who Uh was a teacher at the california school for the blind in like the end of the turn of the century and was super important in terms of like being one of the first americans to like you know to organize blind people he like took a train up and down california you know basically just like going to these little pockets of like isolated blind people and saying like we need to get a bill that pays for readers so that blind people can go to college. Cause obviously this is like about whatever, like a hundred years before, like, you know, 80 years before screen readers. Um, yeah. so if you wanted to go to college, you had to have somebody read books to you. Right. And like, he's agitating for, for things like that, that really like are busting open the doors to allow blind people to get educated in a real way yeah. in the U S and he had this great quote where he was like, you know, in most things, people know me as a Republican, but when it comes to blind blindness, I'm an anarchist or I'm like a, you know, far, far leftist. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, I love that. And, and I, and, you know, I think you still see that in particularly in the NFB, but I think just like across disability in general, it's like, you know, like, like blind blindness is in any group of blind people, not in any group, but like, if you look at a group of blind people sort of in the country, they, they reflect the country, right? There's like, uh, white people, black people, rural, urban, you know, like multiple disabilities, yeah. only one disability, uh, gay, straight, etc., trans. And, um, and politically, yeah, you see that across the spectrum too. I mean, it's interesting. Like, like you said, like 
in terms of Republicans, like, you know, it's a Republican administration that signed the ADA. Right. And yeah. And, and I think one of the places where it gets interesting politically is the question of accommodation, because, you know, so much of of the dialogue or the conversation around disability is about access. Right. And mm-hmm. like making buildings accessible, making websites accessible. And and there's this question of like how much of a. And it's, it's almost like an entitlement, right? Which like conservatives tend to not want. It's like, you know, you want people should just sort of bootstrap up and, and if there's structural inequality, like that's, you know, don't talk about structural inequality. Like everybody can sort of do their own thing. You know, I think if you think about accommodation, that's one place where like the sort of progressive ideals and disability activism align, I think, no matter what your political affiliation, because it's like, well, it has to be an equal playing field. And the only way there's going to be an equal playing field is if like, Blind people do have readers, right? And it's not like an yeah. entitlement. It's like, you know, thinking back to like the 1904 blind person trying to go to UC Berkeley, like like Newell Perry, like it's not just like a matter of like a handout because he's lazy, you know? It's like the guy can't take the classes unless he gets this yeah. accommodation. And it's interesting, like another thing that I found really surprising in the research I did for the book was that this shift that I saw between like that kind of model of of disability activism, the sort of like really civil rights approach, right? Where you're like, yeah, blind people are oppressed, blind people organize together and fight the power, go agitate, you know, on the steps of the Capitol and push through for the rights of blind people, you know, which has really been the main model of blind activism for most of the 20th century. And really it's like recently where you get like disability justice movement which came out of the Bay Area, like starting to get a lot of traction in the in like the 90s and early 2000s with groups like Sins Invalid. And um, there's a really awesome mm-hmm. book called Care Work by Leah Lakshmi Peepsna Samara Sinha. And it's like very oriented around the social justice model, uh, which is which is different than the civil rights approach. You know, it's much more about mm-hmm. intersectionality and about how your disability is inseparable from your race and your class and your gender and your, um, sexual orientation. And, um, and, and there's, I found like a real disconnect between the sort of classic civil rights approach, like blind activists and this sort of new, like super intersectional disability justice approach, which is unmistakably leftist. Right. I mean, they're like abolitionists basically. They're like, we don't want a special, disability legislation because the system is fucked and it's against us. And so what we need to do is dismantle it and like set up, you know, care networks of disabled people helping each other out outside of the system because the system is only is like capitalist and immiserating and it's only going to destroy us. And so, I th- so that's like a whole other piece to the to the terrain that I uncovered. Yeah, yeah it's interesting because like organizations like like those that you're describing, you know, maybe like someone who's more conservative who who wants to be involved with you know disability you know activism they're like i don't i don't agree with that approach right totally but if i talk if i publicly talk about you know disability activism with this po- current political climate now they're going to be viewed as if they are a part of that more um radical kind of of ideology. Totally. I mean, that's why, like, I mean, this is, I, I, you know, I didn't want to write a book about the NFB, but the NFB just like distilled so many of these kind of like, you know, uh, debates that we're talking about that it was, I kind of couldn't avoid it, but like, you know, you had things like at the NFB, the, the, the president Mark Marr for many years, um, you know, there were, there were, there were groups saying we want an LGBT meetup at the NFB convention, like blind, uh, LGBTQ folks wanted to have a meetup. And, um, and, and and I'll tell you a story about it. So like the way that it worked at the NFB convention is if you wanted to like make an announcement, like, you know, like classic car appreciators want to meet up in like room 27 after the main banquet, yeah. uh, you would like braille it on a little card. You would like, you know, braille it with like a slate and stylus or something and then pass it to the like, basically it's like a, you know, on a call in radio show, like there was like the, you know, the screener. So there was like a woman sitting on the podium and like you would pass it to her, she would screen it and then hand it to the president who would then just read it from the podium and be like, okay. And after the banquet, classic car appreciators. And there was this sort of like famous moment where there was like LGBTQ meetup. And this was like, not in the sixties. This was like, I think two thousands. I mean, year after okay. year, they tried to, to make it happen. And he like started reading it. They knew that he was reading their card and then very ostentatiously just ripped up the card and threw it away. And, you know, and I asked oh. him about that, you know, and the idea is 
it's back to that civil rights idea. It's like we're going to, you know, I think you see it like in the black civil rights movement, too. Like there's been there's been people talking about like how the place of women in the black civil rights movement or or gay people, you know, LGBTQ people, trans people, certainly like a lot of these civil rights movements, because they're so single mindedly focused on that one marginalized identity, can't make room for other identities, right? And so the NFB, just to, to, to sort of single them out as an example, has historically been incredibly single-minded in that way. And as a result, like there have been a lot of blind people, whether they're blind people of color or trans people or, or uh, queer people, they they don't feel like there's a place for them there. And, mm. um, you know, they may benefit still from like getting scholarships and getting the legislation that helps them as blind people, but it kind of leaves them high and dry when it comes to the these other parts of their identity. And they, and as a result, they don't feel like they can belong as a part of this blind group too. So it's fascinating. And it's like very 2023, you know, like in terms of like all the sort of identity politics debates that are happening. Yeah. Th- yeah. A thousand percent. It, it's a lot of commonalities. A lot of things are still going on in, in, in that book. I read that chapter about the NFB where it's kind of what you just described kind of sparked, you know, um, the, the AFB, right? right. Oh, the ACB, the, 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 the civil ACB, war. Yeah, yeah. Right. There's it's alphabet soup. But yeah, the, yeah, yeah, the splinter faction where they were like, hell no, we're not going to be a part of this group anymore. And they march across the street and start their own mm-hmm. organization that is very similar, but but separate. But yeah, it's it, it's just the last point I'll make on this is like uh, p- people just want accessibility and accessibility. All it does is make you more independent, which makes you more employable. Mm. So in a sense, it is kind of the quintessential pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Mm. It's just like. It's it's like it's all the same end goal, you know. But I, I, that's why I get confused about you know. Oh, you you what do you not? You don't want people with disabilities to work. That's kind of counterproductive to the whole your whole ideology on the on the right. You know, I mean that kind. I of mean, thing, a lot of the splits know? that I've seen, like particularly between American Council of the Blind (ACB) and National Federation of the Blind (NFB). It's like like yeah. like that one of the big beefs was when when audible pedestrian signals first came out in this country. I think it was like 60s or 70s, you know, where like if now they're yeah. like bird chirping sounds. But at first, I think they were just like really loud bells and people got really pissed off, like sighted people got really pissed off about them because it was just like, <laughs> you know, you would like all of a sudden I was outside of your apartment window it was like ding, ding, like all day long. I mean, people still yeah, hate yeah, them yeah. Um, for that reason. But NFB came out kind of surprisingly against them, you know, and you would think like, okay, like this is a group for the blind. Like, why wouldn't they want something that makes it easier for blind people to cross the street? Their argument was, you know, if I'm trying to get a job as a blind person and you think that the only way I can cross the street is if I hear a loud bell dinging to signal when it's cross, when it's time to cross, like, how are you going to expect me to be able to figure out the layout of the office or like, you know, get across town yeah. where they don't have them? And, and they really like agitated hard against these. And there's many examples like accessible currency. Like there's all, all these beefs between ACB and NFB that I think are kind of hooked around the same kind of ideological difference where the NFB is like, we want the perception of blind people in society to be that like blindness is just an incidental characteristic. It's like hair color. It's like, yeah, I happen to be mm-hmm. blind. I happen to be blonde, you know, like whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, and so then if you try to treat me separate and special in this way, you're going to you're going to make blindness seem like this sad and like infantilizing thing. And the ACB is like, what are you talking about? Like, these are actually really helpful. And I think this kind of gets back a little bit to the kind of progressive conservative divide thing, or at least like in terms of um, the intersectional thing, because like one, one, one idea is like, let's say this is the idea I got from a, a friend of mine, John Lee Clark, who's a deaf blind poet. You know, the way he said it to me was like, what if I'm, drunk, you know, and then like, I'm trying to get through the subway, uh, system. And, and, you know, another d- debate was about the tactile dots in the subway system. Like, you know, the bump dots in front of the subway. Yeah. You know, and he's like, what if I'm, uh, what if I have multiple disabilities? You know, what if I have, uh, like a cognitive disability and I'm blind also like then those are really going to help you. And so there's this phrase that I really love that I've heard people use to describe, um, some of this. So it's like vanilla blind, you know, and like vanilla blind is like, you don't have any other disabilities. You don't really have any other like marginalized identities. You're just like a white dude who's like full hearing, you know, no, no cognitive or mobility disabilities. You're vanilla blind. Like blindness is the only thing that you sort of have to contend with. And a lot of those debates, I feel like around like audible pedestrian signals or, you know, the tactile truncated domes, like it's for a vanilla blind person who's just like, had like three shots of espresso, has a PhD in political science, eight hours of sleep, 
you know, perfect training in their cane skills and they're like, aha, I don't need tactile bump tones. Like I can totally mm. use all my cane skills to find this. And, you know, and what it leaves out is a lot of blind people who might have cognitive disabilities or ne are neurodivergent or are like wasted. And, you know, like why not build the world to accommodate, you know, so it kind of gets back to this idea of like how narrow is your aperture of compassion? You know, like, are you only thinking about a blind person and is, and who is that blind person? You know? And I think there is this sort of yeah. like, stereotype of like that blind person's like a vanilla blind person and it's really interesting to try to imagine different sorts of blind people and what they might need and and then when you when you do these debates get a lot more complicated oh yeah it's very complex and the, the community as a whole is very complex and there's so many differing opinions and you know that's why I, you know when people say i speak for a, a community i'm like do you yeah because it's kind of like you know i don't think everyone's on the in agreement on that yeah. so it's like um you know, you speak for yourself and maybe people, a group of maybe a certain percentage of the group. Yeah. But yeah, I've never heard the vanilla blind <laughs> thing. I'm not quite sure how I, how I feel mm. about that. It's like, uh, you know, cause I, I always feel like, um, in terms of the comments like that, it's like, you don't know about like, uh, upbringing traumatic past traumatic events mm -hmm. and things like that so it's it's always like yeah on average maybe vanilla blind's a good category but it's it doesn't mean it's necessarily if like because i guess i fit into that category i'm like, i do too well, you don't really know me mm. you don't really know my backstory so i think don't really, i think don't try to classify i think the point is less like that like you as a vanilla blind person aren't like, I mean, I, I see what you're saying. I think the, the, I think the thing to hold in mind is more this idea that like, when you, when you imagine a blind person and what they need, who are you imagining and who might be excluded from like the average, like the sort of automatic picture you have in your head, you know, because yeah. the, 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 the reality is you probably aren't imagining an autistic blind person, right? You probably aren't imagining a blind person in a wheelchair or like, you know, uh, a, tr a trans blind person, let's say. And there are real mm. considerations that like those, those people have that often aren't captured in like legislation or, uh, you know, accommodations, right? Like, like a, a friend of mine, Kathy Kudlick, um, who's blind historian was organizing, um, an art exhibit or like a, like a historical exhibit about the 504 sit in in San Francisco in like a gallery, you know, with like photos and, you know, and, and she she ran the Paul Longmore um, Disability Studies Center at San Francisco State University. And so it was just like super like everybody was disabled. Everybody was thinking a lot about disability. And they were like, we're going to do this right, obviously. Right. And so they put it up and, and, and they had this thing called uh, they, 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 they put Braille like, you know, Braille captions under all the photos. Like, OK, a blind person is going to come. Mm -hmm. They can't access the photos. But boom, like you got Braille right there. And then it was, there was a blind person in a wheelchair and they were like, I can't reach the Braille. And she was like, oh, right. Like, <laughs> you can't like you can't think of everything. But so uh, it's just such a, a fascinating conundrum. Right. Like, how do you account for yeah. everybody's experience? And, and it's like one of those things where it's very easy, I think, for you and I as a sort of like, you know, I'm going to push on the vanilla blind thing for a second. Like, it's easy for us to be like, you know, you got to make it accessible for us because we're like the blind guy. Right. But then mm -hmm. there's always this other step you can take to like widen that aperture to be like, well, okay, we've included blindness, but like, have we included deaf blindness? Have we included, uh, you know, neurodivergence? And, um, so I think if you want to think about disability rights, like you have to sort of constantly be pushing at the edges of what you consider to be a category that should be protected. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I, I'm, I'm all about accessibility in terms of, you know, making it multi-layered and not just you know, the specifics of it. Yeah. So in terms of accessibility, like I, I, I run into some issues with my podcast even cause it's like, I'm independent, I'm doing everything solo. Mm. Um, so it's like, I, I don't provide transcripts for example, oh, okay. for, for my episodes. Yeah. And it's like, I really would like to, but I, it's like, I would put out way less episodes to make transcripts. So it's just kind of like a choice I have to make. Yeah or I'd have to spend money to pay someone to do it for me or, and things like yep. that. And, you know, if I, if I start making, you know, income from this and, you know, it'll be something I, I definitely prioritize, but sometimes it's like, I, you know, I feel guilty mm. and, uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's like, all right, I can either put more work out there 
shine a light on more issues or I can put less work out there and there's transcripts and it's like, I, I mean, who knows which one is more beneficial? Yeah. Um, I mean, you got to put yourself you know, in, the, in the shoes of like, you know, I, I have the same, I, I totally sympathize with that. And I did a podcast for a while and like didn't have any disability consciousness and didn't put out transcripts until basically I started writing yeah. about blindness and disability. And I was like, Oh shit. Okay. Right. I do need to do this. But like, I totally respect that, that sort of, that it's a journey and that, you know, yeah. you sort of gradually come around to like how accessibility works. I would encourage you to do it. And, you know, there's like automated transcripts that, um, might be pretty light lift in terms of like, they may not be perfect transcripts, but at least you're like starting there and then maybe you get a volunteer. Yeah. But I, the thing I was going to say is like, I don't, I, I don't want to, you know, I have no judgment at all. Like I think that, um, I think transcripts are an important practice and I, and I respect you for kind of like being open about that guilt or that ambivalence about it. For me, the thing that comes up a lot is that I'm also like hesitant to even bring up, but it, it is masking, um, you know, and like, like following like disability justice folks on online, you know, I, I'm, I'm seeing over and over again, people say like, you know, I'm seeing all these people who claim to be like allies of disabled people in public, like photos of them in public without wearing masks. And like, there are people who are immunocompromised who like would be protected if, you know, I would be able to go to that reading if everyone was wearing a mask, but like nobody's wearing a mask and I'm excluded. And it's the same thing where I'm like, I'm an, I think of myself as an ally, you know, and I think of myself as like, you know, really like I understand the power of accessibility now in a way that I never did before. And yet I'm still like, really, am I going to wear a mask to that thing? <laughs> you know, like I really don't want to, you know, and, and I think there's a lot of ways that it's easy to kind of like wriggle out of that. But then I think if you really want to, you know, I think it comes down to any kind of like political, you know, the political and the personal, right? Like, you know, that eating meat is contributing to climate change and animal suffering, but also like, I grilled chicken last night. Right. And like, and it's like, I think mm -hmm. it's a version of that where it's like, you have to sort of, you have the, these ideas in your head, but how much of them are you actually going to put into practice? And I think that gets back to the idea that we started with where it's like, it's a practice, you know, like maybe one day you like, you're lazy and you, uh, you don't, you don't follow through entirely, but like if you can get there 90% of the time that that's going to make a, a difference. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I think in terms of like the, um, the mass thing, it's kind of like, I think if I were at an event and I knew specifically there was going to be immunocompromised people there, I would, and they requested that, yeah. you know, I would wear a mask, but it's, it's like, I don't, I, I haven't worn a mask in years, <laughs> two years, or whatever, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and I'm taking the subway, yeah. you know, I'm flying, traveling and, uh, I'm not saying that like in a bragging way, right. but it, it's just like, uh, what's the, your take on that? Cause there's like, there has to be like a practicality right. in the sense of, all right, COVID is kind of, it's, it's, um, mutated. It's not as dangerous. There's vaccines available, you know, no one else is wearing masks. It's kind of like, and maybe this is, an ableist thing for me to say, but it's like, you're, you're almost like an, an outlier. So to expect yeah. everyone else to, to wear a mask, you know, I don't, maybe I'm uneducated on the sense of immunocompromised people and how much COVID actually affects them. Right. But it's kind of like it, I see this on like Twitter and things like that, yeah. where people were, you know, and I'm kind of like, Oh, people are still talking about COVID. Right. And I'm like, I thought that was long gone. You know, I, like I live in New York city. It's one of the most progressive cities ever and no one wears masks, yeah, yeah. you know? So it's like, if it, if no one's wearing masks in somewhere like New York city, right. then like there, there is no hope for masks to come back. Well, so yeah. at a certain point, do you, do you have to just accept it? All right, I'm fucked. I'm immunocompromised. Masks are done. Yeah. Like at what point do you just say, all right, I'm going to quit trying to get people to wear masks. I just have to accept that masks are gone. That's such a good question. And something I think about, I mean, I think maybe to pull it back into blindness, like where it would hit closer to home, like, I think it's, I think it's, it's a lot easier for me to say, like, I mean, you know, you know, I still having some vision, it makes it a little more complicated. But for example, like when I wanted, was trying to finish my book and I was using a Mac and then I like really wanted to use a screen reader and like Microsoft Word with a screen reader on the Mac just sucks. Like it doesn't work. It just breaks. Right. And I was like going on to, um, 
these like message boards and like seeing people and they were like, oh, yeah. like there's like Mac users, uh, Mac screen reader users using Word. And they were just like, oh, yeah, like it worked. But then they like there was this update that happened in February and now it doesn't work again. And then, you know, I'd look, look at the message like a month later and they'd be like, OK, now it works. And like for me, I'm like, that's unacceptable, right? Like I paid for this software. I paid a lot of money for this MacBook. I paid a lot of money to like have Microsoft Word. And like as a blind user, I like can't use it to make my living as a writer. Right. Like, and that just felt unacceptable to me. But at the same time, like your your point about immunocompromised folks, like blind people are outliers, right? Like the vast majority Mm -hmm. of Mac users and voice and, uh, uh, word users are cited. And so like, it's the same question. Like, does Apple or Microsoft have any obligation to like make that shit work? Or is it like, well, maybe like the ship has flown. Like it's kind of like being in New York city, right? Like the vast majority of Mac users, aren't using it. So maybe it's fine. And like, it's harder for me to, I mean, you know, I, I sympathize with, with what you're saying about masking, but then I think when it starts to hit closer to home with something that like, you know, I can't use because I'm an outlier, it's a lot tougher. So I think it just keeps cutting back to this question of like, how wide are you willing? And I think it's important to acknowledge, are you able to keep that aperture of compassion? Right. Cause like at a certain point, like it does become too much. And you can't be, you know, this is like, it's down to like these like bonkers ethical conversations where it's like, well, I can't eat wheat because like, if I'm a hardcore vegan, then like the insects are being like threshed in like the wheat harvesting, mm-hmm. you know? And like, if you go too far in that direction, you like truly don't just have to basically die because like just existing yeah. is like your, your existence is going to oppress something. Um, yeah. you know, so you got to draw a lot, draw, draw a line somewhere and, and, and mm-hmm. everybody draws their line in a different place, you know? And I think, I think Definitely. ultimately you got to figure out where your line is. And I think, I think it's worth remembering or worth emphasizing that like that line doesn't have to be permanent. Right. And ideally every day you're like engaging, having conversations, thinking about this stuff so that maybe your line moves a little bit and maybe you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. I do mask in these situations. Your line now. should never be static. I yeah. think. And I think a lot of people's are, Yeah, you know, my line's constantly swaying left and right, yeah. you know? Um, and I like that. I like that. It's not fixed, you know? That's something I take pride in, mm. in the sense that I'm a, I take in information and then I process yeah. it and then my line moves. And then it, it's a constant, you know, needle kind of dial moving, you know, moving around. And, and uh, I think more people should be like that in the sense, like going back to like the medical social model, it's like, I talk about like it being like a Venn diagram mm. and you know, the, like at the center, it, I would say would be like on, on like the medical side, it's like your disability is your, is the problem. You must solve the disability on the social model. Like you said, is, is, uh, society's the problem. My disability is, is perfectly fine. Yeah. And then there's like <clears throat> the middle I'd say, which is like society based on the history. I mean, you, you talk a lot about history in your book too. It's of, of blindness and how it's been perceived throughout time, but it's like, Blindness is, has been given a bad rep for ever. Yeah. And it's probably always going to have a bad reputation mm-hmm. or be viewed as, you know, as an outlier to use that word again. So I need to be, accept that too, I, you know, but at the same time, I also would like to kind of push the boundaries and maybe advocate to kind of change people's perspectives and, yeah. And so it's like, I think there's like a bonus. I think a lot of people get really upset and hung up when they want to make the change now Mm. and they put too much emphasis on societal change versus personal Mm. change. And I'm, I'm more of like an advocate of kind of know, know the realities of things. And then I'm kind of like a, opinion of like, be a little bit more selfish. What's going to benefit you more? Because just like you, you wrote this book. That's a lot of hard work. You know, your, your hard work on writing this book is going to be read and therefore you're going to affect people's mindsets and and knowledge of things, Mm -hmm. you know, and that's your form of advocacy, you know, and then something happens from it. Um, in the same sense, like, you know, Sheridan, you know, we know Sheridan O'Donnell, mm-hmm. the filmmaker, like the fact that he's making films is inspiring to everyone in the sense, like me included is like, oh, maybe I can be 
a legally blind, you know, filmmaker. Mm-hmm. And it's through, to me, it's like through actions, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of people get so bogged down by the scale of how many problems there are mm. that it freezes them from, you know, making something or, or actually be, being actionable, mm. you know, and creating something, you know, and, uh, you know, I may be, I may be making that up. I don't know, but it's, it's like, you get, you follow me at all in a sense, like you kind of have to accept there has to be some sort, some sort of acceptance of the realities of, of how the world is. But that doesn't mean that you can't cha- try to change it either. That's interesting. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I mean, I'm trying to think if I agree or not. I mean, I think, yeah, I think. And it's okay if you disagree. Oh, I you think know, acceptance, it, the only thing I would change would be the word acceptance. You know, I think you have to understand the way things are. And identify yeah, it. Yeah, understand is a good word. And I guess yeah. there is acceptance in that, right? You have to be like, okay, this is this is the current reality, but then yeah. you can also like reject it as unacceptable, right? And say like, yeah. this is unacceptable that like, you know, blind people to go back to Newell Perry, you know, the turn of the century, like it's unacceptable that the only way you're going to be able to go to college as a blind person is if you happen to be the kid of a millionaire who can like hire a team of people and read all your textbooks to you. Right. Like the kid growing up, the blind kid, you know, who wants to go to college, who doesn't have access to that amount of money for readers should be able to learn what they want to learn too. Right. And so like they accept that reality, but then they say, hell no. And, uh, Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, but then there's actions that go forth about it, you know, and, and I, I think as long as there are actions, I'm okay with it. It can be completely like against how I even view it. I just want people to do stuff and not just tweet about it, <laughs> you know, and not, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's so much just like social media activism, which is mm. fine. It has its place, but I think some people just stop there, Yeah. you yeah. know, and it's like I'm I'm more into like what products are like what product are you you making what what like you know I mean maybe that's a harsh take but it there's so much just talking mm-hmm. and, and not enough doing you know yeah. and I'm more of a fan of the doers I guess yeah yeah I mean one place I see that a lot is in accessibility you know and you see somebody like like I mean I, I shouldn't call out this place by name because I'm not sure but like there was a magazine that put out an accessibility issue recently that I was really excited to read and I downloaded the PDF, you know, I like subscribed to the magazine to get access to the PDF. I downloaded the PDF and the PDF was inaccessible. My screen reader couldn't read it unless I Mm. OCR'd it. And I was like, huh, like a lot of back padding going on around here to do an accessibility issue and a complete failure to make that issue accessible. And that's ironic. And that is like far from an isolated incident, right? Like you see that all the time with people like we have a commitment to diversity and like accessibility. And then you're like, but you also posted that image without alt text. So like, Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing here? Yeah. And so it's that kind of hypocrisy. I think that, that you just is so common on social media, but also just in the world where like, it's very easy to say, like, we believe in it's like inclusion. me with the transcripts, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, but you know, but you're, I mean, I think you're doing the important step of acknowledging it and thinking about it, you know? And I think, I mean, that's something yeah. that I really enjoyed about writing this book was like, for me personally, I get really turned off by like the turned up to 11 activism, uh, where people are like, canceling you and calling you out and like I recognize the value of that and like you know there is there are moments all the time of just absolutely horrible things happening that you have to sort of say this is unacceptable this is urgent we have to move around it but I often find that like the thing that moves my line that we're talking about you know of like moving me towards like maybe I am gonna mask in these situations or maybe I am gonna like write alt text for all my tweets it's often like it comes through story for me and and comes through like a human experience and a human connection. And so when I was writing my book, you know, I think there are versions of my book that would have felt a lot more like, okay, reader, if you don't want to be canceled, as soon as you put this book down, here are like the 10 (laughs) things you got to do and got to know. And also I hate you, you know? And like, I just, as a reader, I know, like, I'm not going to read that book. I'm not going to get past the second page. And like, it's not going to change me. And even if, and if I am going to read to the end, I'm already somebody who's like already on board and I'm just reading it to feel good about myself that like Mm -hmm. somebody else agrees with me. And so in the book, like there are, I tell stories very similar to you talking about not including transcripts where I'm just like, I was hanging out with this developmentally, you know, this intellectually uh, disabled blind guy. And like, my first thought was like, what is this guy doing at the blindness convention? Cause like, yeah. 
well, this is, I remember you that know, point. and like, that's an ugly thought that I had. And, um, but it felt really important to include it because I feel like what it does for the reader is it's sort of like, it's like, I'm not holier than thou. I'm not like angry, blind dude throwing lightning bolts down upon thee. It's like, this is a journey. Mm-hmm. This is a process. And like, you know, I never use the f- a phrase as, as forceful as like dismantling ableism. But like, if that's what we're talking about, like if you want to dismantle ableism, I feel like the way I'm going to do that in the most, in the highest percentage of readers is through like a human and very fallible and vulnerable story like that, rather than like you be canceled and like game over. Yeah. Oh, a thousand percent. And that's why I, I really appreciate your writing and why I'm, I'm such a fan of what I've read so far is you're not like, you're very vulnerable. You're very um, authentic, and you share insights like you know, like that that story about what goes on your inner dialogue. And I think it's very relatable because I think we all have those inner dialogues. And I think you know, but our brains also make us think re- really weird thoughts too. <laughs> like you know, it's like you know, I'm I'm a married man, but sometimes I'll be out in New York City, and I can't help but like check someone out, mm. even though I don't want mm-hmm. to or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, as a kid, I remember this is a strange thing to share, but it's like I was helping my dad with uh, he was building something and I'm holding a hammer for him. And I had the thought in my mind, like, oh, I could hit my dad in the Mm -hmm. head with the hammer Mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And it's like those intrusive thoughts, you know. Yeah, Yeah, I guess what that's what they would be called is like intrusive thoughts. And we all have them. And sometimes they're very mean and sometimes they're very ableist. You know, you know, we all deal with internalized ableism. Um, and I think that's just putting a fancy name on, you know, having an intrusive thought about disability, you know, that's, that's in a negative kind of tone. Um, but I, I love that you shared that and you didn't like try to hide that you didn't try to like, cause I think even the people, and this may be a hot take, but I think even the people who are like the highest, you know, are, are those like level 12 activists, I think. I know for a fact they have internalized ableism and I know for a fact they have those intrusive thoughts yeah, yeah. and they just don't share it because they know it's going to affect their image. And I think we need more vulnerability. We need more um, authenticity in the sense of how people truly feel to kind of, you know, dissect it and figure out where, where like, how do we change things? I think if you're pretending, it kind of goes back to my point of, living in reality it's mm. like for example you you knew the reality of writing when you were writing this book you're like i don't want to talk down to people because i know people are, are not going to enjoy that so that's you kind of being like grounded in reality i kind of know what a reader is going to think and i'm going to factor that in and i think those level 12 you know activists with they they're not thinking about is my delivery actually the most efficient and effective way to communicate this to create change mm. and you know maybe if i dumbed it down, you know, to them, they might be like, I'm, I'm dumbing it down mm. or, you know, I'm, I'm simplifying it too much or I'm being too generous and they're not generous to me. So why should I be generous to them? Yeah. You know, but it's like, it's, it's all about like this. Um, it's all about to me, how can you build relationships with people who don't think the same way as you? And, and those are the, the, to me, the, in my opinion, the, times where like actual change happens, Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. where people with deferring opinions, if it's constantly us versus them, it's going to stay us versus them. And I think just admitting, you know, Hey, it's human nature to have intrusive thoughts or I'm not perfect. And I think, you know, every now and then I think an ableist thought, but you know, I don't go, it's not like an actionable thing. I don't think it. And then I go do it, you know? that it's okay. You know, I, I don't, I don't know quite where I'm going no, no. with that. I kind of got lost. No, no, it makes a lot it's... of sense. I mean, I think I want to say like, you know, the level 12 activists, I think has a place, has a role in the struggle, you know, and in society. And I don't want to say like, that's the wrong way. They should all be writing like long form narrative nonfiction books about uh, their issue. Cause that's the, the, <laughs> the, the better way to get to people. I think of it like, you know, if you think about like a village, let's say, you know, like there are the warriors and then there's like the farmers and then there's like the, medicine woman or whatever, you know, whatever. I don't know why I suddenly went yeah, to like, yeah, a, yeah. To like a, tr- a traditional village, but like <laughs> whatever, you know, like in a, in a town, right. You got like the plumbers and yeah. you got the school teachers. And, you know, I think there's, I think there, it, 
level 12 activism is absolutely like a necessary job in the like Mr. Rogers neighborhood of like a utopian society. I think you do need people on the front lines who are like calling out injustice in an urgent way when injustice is urgently felt. I also think that like, you know, the kind of work of like a writer is important too to sort of like capture mm. these, like you said, like the sort of interiority and like all these other sort of more slow moving, but like big uh, feelings. And I think it's, I think it's why I became a writer because like having that experience as a reader of, you know, it's interesting your, your idea of the intrusive thought, you know, cause in some ways like reading the experience of reading a book is like having one long intrusive thought. That's like the writer is intruding into your mind, you know, and you're like, you're inhabiting somebody else's brain for a while. And, and that's one of the things that makes reading and writing so powerful is that you can both travel somewhere else and like and ex and, and, and see the world through somebody else's eyes but then also recognize all the ways in which you're similar and like there's something in that slippage between like oh okay this person i've got so much in common with them but then there's all these these differences and then that's i think what can really move that that ethical or like lifeline that we've been talking about like maybe mm -hmm. the way that they're angle on this is different than mine like maybe i want mine to resemble that more or the opposite you're like you know i think it's just as important yeah. to read things you disagree with and say like hmm that actually sharpens the contours of where i stand on this issue yeah. and so uh yeah that's i think that's just like why i became a writer yeah and i think there's a lot of echo chambers out there i know that seems like a buzzword but it's like there's a lot of echo chambers out there and it's just people you know speaking to the void and getting pats on the back from people who already agree with them. It's mm -hmm. like, and that's one of my goals with, you know, the see-through podcast is to reach, you know, not just be a podcast for people with disabilities or blindness, but just a podcast that anyone would enjoy listening to. Just every episode is entertaining and you'll learn something along the way. Um, it's hard to do, you know, but, but it's like, I am trying to bridge the gap between the two worlds, you know, and that's kind of a goal of mine. And uh, the way I, I plan to do it or am trying to do it is to just be relatable and kind of a facilitator of d deferring opinions, different perspectives, different, you know, experiences and, you know, be an open mind in the process, just kind of curious. I think a lot of people are curious about disability. Yeah. I, I mean, you know? I, um, I got that question a lot when I was writing the book, which was like, who is this book for? And is it for a blind audience? Is it for a sighted audience? And, you know, it being a commercial publisher it like necessarily had to be for more than just blind people. Um, but it was really tricky to think about who, how to write a book for everybody, you know, like how to write something that wasn't too narrowly focused on, on any one particular aspect. And, um, I used to work as a magazine editor and, and this was something that we talked about a lot in terms of the, the, the articles we ran in the magazine, which was like, you have to have the, you have to be able to speak both to like an expert audience and to an audience who doesn't have any uh, knowledge about the subject matter. Yeah. And like the, and an example that one of my, one of my mentors gave me was like, imagine you're at a dinner party and to your left is like a really bright 10th grader. And to your right is like a professor of geology at Harvard, you know? And like, yeah. how are you going to talk about, you know, like the fossil record in a way that keeps both of them engaged? And it's not an impossible yeah. task. Like there's a way that you can talk about stuff. Like you're not gonna be able to say anything that the professor doesn't already know. Cause they're the expert. Like you don't have a PhD mm -hmm. in geology, but you can talk about it in such a way that they'll be like, huh? Like I like their interpretation of how mm -hmm. the fossil record is built. Like that's a neat metaphor, you know, and they can still like learn, like be engaged and, and, yeah. and, but then not so, you're not going to go so far that down that realm that the, the 10th grader is going to be like, I have no idea what they're talking about. Right. Like you can do it in a way that is engaging yeah. for both people. And, and I think that that's not only like a good thing to do commercially, cause then like more people buy your book, but I think there's like a, a kind of like moral or intellectual, I don't know what, what you want to call it, but there's like a way in which when you can write in that register or talk in that register, honestly, like it kind of, it brings everybody up, I think, because it's like a way it's like, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be an expert and you, mm -hmm. you don't have to talk down to anybody. And like, it's like, it's kind of like what you were saying about, it's like a more inclusive way to think. And, um, and so I just, I found it really exciting to, when I felt like I was hitting that 
note because to me like when when i can write in that way that anybody can come along but i'm not simplif oversimplifying or anything like all the complexity yeah. is there but like you don't need a phd in disability studies to get there uh then i feel like there's a lot of possibility in 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 changing people's minds and like starting a conversation in that way oh yeah and we all see you know films that where it's like it's it's like obvious that you know they're they think the audience is unintelligent you know and and, it, and then people pick up on that you know even the audience that they wanted to reach and you know that's the same for every art form and it's like there's a skill in kind of being able to think of everyone mm. you know and not being so hyper spe specific and uh, i think a lot of you know successful people in the media space are aware of that you know? I mean, it's kind of the theme of our conversation today where it's like you know as a yeah. as a as a creator you want to be thinking of everyone but then also like as a as a activist or as like a you yeah. know political thinker you want to think about who's being excluded from from what you're making no that's a great point have you seen this new netflix movie called happiness for beginners i have not but i just saw i was just on um you talk about it in your book yeah. but the retina is pigmentosa like thread yeah facebook page the support group yeah and i i was just on there and i saw someone had posted about it like hey they, one of the characters has rp yeah, yeah yeah but like i i don't really know too much about it i've actually seen it on netflix i've like looked at it and i was like huh but then I like went to the next one. I had no clue it had anything to do yeah, yeah, yeah. with RP. But have you watched I, it? My wife and I watched it last night. She's also on the, she does not have RP, but um, she's on yeah, that, yeah, yeah. that Facebook page. And she said that people were talking about it. And then I've started to get like emails from random strangers after my book came out. And then somebody wrote to me and they were like, check this out. The guy, like the character reminded me of you. And so we watched it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, we could talk about it if you had seen it. I don't know if we need to go there, but I don't really recommend the film, but it is interesting thinking about like, audience and like like how much it assumes of its audience's intelligence you know I, I did not feel I did not feel like it had a very high view of my intelligence watching that movie uh, uh, <laughs> but that's just one man's opinion oh yeah but I yeah I'm gonna watch it out of, just out of curiosity it's like I watched a few episodes of that tv show too what was it called like, in the dark in the dark yeah, yeah it wasn't it wasn't for me I'll just say yeah. that I wrote it I wrote an article about that that show I don't know if you saw it um no. Yeah, I got to actually go on the set. Um, the article was, uh, the title of it was, is there a right way to act blind? And because there was, there was oh, a big yeah. controversy around that show because they cast a sighted actress mm -hmm. in the role of the blind main character and the NFB boycott it and, and they like picketed in front of CBS and they were like, you know, nothing about us without us. Like it's time to hire blind actors. And so yeah. I kind of wrote about that controversy, but then like went on set with, they had a blind writer on set. So I was like hanging out with the, with Ryan Knighton, who was, uh, if you should read his book, if you haven't, um, cockeyed is the name of it. Okay. And you should definitely talk to him for your podcast too. He's brilliant. Um, he's okay. got RP. It was a really wild experience to be on set with him. Like just like experiencing a, a TV set as a blind person, but then also just thinking about like that question, like what does it actually mean to act blind? Like how is this performance authentic or inauthentic because it's a sighted actress uh, playing the role. So I like, you know, was not a super big fan of the show, but I definitely forced myself to watch every single episode in order to write that piece. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that you can create uh riots with what, however you answer that one, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and it's a topic I've wanted to, to bring up on my podcast, but I've almost been kind of sitting on, trying to figure out what exactly I, how I feel about yeah. it because you know I went to film school mm. and you know I work I'm a video editor mm. you know and and I made some short films in my my life and things like that um so I, I don't know I it was a different time then so it's like now it's a you know it seems like it's in a Hollywood's like in a different era mm -hmm. but I kind of like what I've kind of come to think is like the the C model i think that's the name of that show oh yeah uh is that the where Apple TV they had, one where like everybody in the world yeah, is gone with, blind with jason momoa yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh they have they one they hire a lot of blind actual blind actors mm -hmm. but you know obviously jason momoa isn't blind um but what they do is they have like someone on set yeah you know who who's kind of like a coach he's 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 he is blind himself and he kind of is able to kind of coach the actors and kind of train them in a, in a way yeah. to, to kind of act like that. And I'm like, all right, well, you're kind of, you're one, you're hiring people from the community. Mm -hmm. And then you're also ensure, 
and hiring a coach to ensure that there's authenticity there and it comes off as in a, in a, in a way that's respected by, you know, the blind community. And I, I kind of like that model where if you have to book a, you know, non disabled or, you know, what depends on what the role is that at least have, at least at the the very least you could do is to make it realistic mm -hmm. and not some like bullshit where it's <laughs> like, you know, it's like at least make it authentic, authentic yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. That's like the least you could do. The the most you could do, the best thing you could do is like, you know, obvious, just hire someone who's actually disabled to play the role. Yeah. Yeah. That was interesting. Like, but if you're going to get Daniel Day Lewis, like, you know, it's like that one movie, he won the, like, the Academy Award for it. But it's like, as a filmmaker, in my mind, I'm like, if I could get Daniel Day Lewis in my film, mm -hmm. you know, am I gonna say no to that? Right. Just because the role is disabled, right? You know, because right, right. it, it's you see what I'm you see where I'm going with? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky. Like, I might like, hire him. Like, like, like <laughs> when that piece came out uh, in the New York Times Magazine, like you know, there's comments they like they allowed for comments to be posted, and some people were like, "Excuse me, like, isn't that what actors do? Right? Like, actors, yeah. like, if I'm having a movie about a a bank robber." who's missing his left pinky. Like, I don't have to find an actor who's a bank robber who's missing his left pinky. Like we can just have an actor do that. Like that's the whole point of all acting. But on the other hand, mm -hmm. it's like, there is this history of marginalization in Hollywood and in society. And like, you know, blackface, for example, is like a really complicated and painful past. Like you would never dream of having a white actor play a black character. Uh, and, 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 there's like a whole spectrum of kind of considerations between them. Like, I don't want to equate. Disability. Yeah. That's probably as worst as the worst, you know, that's probably like the worst form of it that I'm aware of. Yeah. And like some people do like call, have the word crip face where they're like, basically like this is a version of blackface, but with disability, like I've some, when I was writing the article, somebody warned me, they were like, don't talk about crip face because that's actually like aligning you know, a much more painful history of like yeah, I've never heard minstrelsy of and blackface that like it's, 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 it's a different situation with disability. And I think that's true, but I also think it's not quite so simple as to say like, that's what actors do, you know? Yeah. You know, in that argument, I think to my point, I think everyone, I think what makes everyone happy is if it's authentic and seems in line with reality. Mm -hmm. I think where everyone gets really mad is if you have someone playing a blind person and they're, you know, wearing sunglasses and their head's just like tilted up to the sky mm -hmm. and they're looking around aimlessly mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of tired, you know, trope, you know, it's just like very, one, it's very like lazy acting. And then two, it's, it's just like, it's an insult to to actual blind people so it's like <clears throat> and then it's like I, I did a video i had this little series i did I, I haven't done one in a while but it was called ableist or chill and i i kind of analyzed certain scenes mm. um from tv shows and movies and i basically gave my verdict on it is something ableist or is it chill you know, <laughs> meaning it's just funny you know and i did <clears throat> sheridan actually sent me it but it was from the movie um dog with channing tatum mm. And there's a scene where he pretends to be blind so he can get a discount in a hotel uh -huh. and he's wearing like the sunglasses, you know, the wraparound sunglasses that, you know, kind of cover your eyes. Yeah. He has a cane when he's talking to the front desk receptionist, he's kind of looking up, uh -huh. not even in her direction. Uh -huh. And he, he's kind of given like a sob story about blindness. Uh -huh. And it's like, that was not that long ago. And like that stuff is still getting done. So was that ableist or was that chill? Oh yeah, it was definitely okay. ableist. And, and, um, but what, what blows my mind is like in this day and age is like, everything is so, so like, everyone's so gung ho and about like, you know, diversity, equity and inclusion, mm -hmm. but it's like that made it through the cracks, <laughs> like that made it through and no one even thought about it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a, you know, it's a point people make a lot. Like I've heard Sheridan make it too. I think where diversity and diversity equity inclusion means you know racial inclusion it means gender diversity uh it it means sexual orientation it it, it, it increasingly means disability but traditionally like no like that's not really yeah. been part of the conversation Obviously not, yeah. you know. and i think hollywood is a really good example of that like you're pointing out like like people have been much more attuned to racial diversity and gender diversity in in yeah. film than they have in terms of disability disabled actors and so i do think that mm -hmm. like 
while the number of disabled roles compared to the number of disabled actors that are cast is so bad. Like, I do think that there is some kind of like affirmative action that needs to happen where uh, people people should should feel embarrassed about casting non-disabled actors even if that doesn't mean that like philosophically like the point of like you know i I don't want to make the argument that like no actor shall ever play an identity that they don't share but i think like while there are these huge imbalances like it is worth pushing back oh a thousand percent and and one thing it would encourage more people to go into that line of work yeah if you if you really did feel like a sense of oh i can do that Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. And, and I've always thought like, I think what like needs to happen is we need like, you know, obviously it goes, everyone knows this, but I don't know if people actually think about it, but it's like, if we had, imagine if like a Harry Styles level celebrity was blind, mm-hmm. how much the perspective of blindness would change just because so many people are going to be thinking about it in a different way. I mean, Stevie Wonder is Harry Styles. Stevie Wonder crushes Harry Styles with his celebrity. I mean, I'm old, but... That's true. That's true. Or Ray Charles. But I'm talking about... Yeah, I'm not talking musically. Oh, but I just... In <laughs> terms of like their place in like the American consciousness, like everybody knows those two names, even little kids, right? Yeah, I guess I'm thinking more of like a... Um, and, and unfortunately I'm speaking in the sense of like a sex symbol kind of thing where mm-hmm. like teen, teen, teenage girls or like preteens are like learning about blindness yeah. and, and, and that, and then, cause I feel like what happens is men kind of emulate what women want. Mm-hmm. So it's like, even then they're going to be more open to learning about it. It may be a bad take. I don't know. It's just something I thought of. Like if you had like a, just it basically long story short my point is a list you know we need more a list people with disabilities because it's going to make people it's just going to put it on more people's radars is all definitely is basically my point definitely you know yeah i mean i think back and, to like the uh, village model right like we need a list celebrities with disabilities we also need like your boss at at like kinkos to be disabled yeah. you know and like your coworker, and like your teacher and like multiple kids in your class and you know i think when it feels you know it's about integration you know i think blind people in particular are just like are hidden from the rest of the world a lot and so when you do see mm-hmm. somebody you're just like oh my god how is he even across the street you know whereas if like there's enough critical mass out in the world like on tv in your workplace in your yeah. school then you're like i'm not going to even question how that guy's going to cross the street because like i just saw him like prepare a chicken cordon bleu for my sister-in-law, you know, whatever, you know, it's like, exactly. You gotta, yeah. It's, it's about integration. Yeah. And I guess I was, I agree completely more people all across the board, but I'm talking, I guess my point was specifically about just what's like a slick way to get reach mass, mass audiences. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's the classic, like teen bop, teen pop star. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and this is, this will be the last point I make. And I think we can wrap up here is, um, and I, I even talked about this in terms of being a doer and creating something. Yeah. It does put a lot of pressure on the counter, the counter opinion of that is it does put a lot of pressure on disabled people to take matters into their own hands. Like you, you decided to write this book, mm-hmm. you know, you, you know, so it's like, but you're also an author. You could write, you could have wrote about million other topics mm. and ideas, you know, do you, do you ever feel like a frustration that you have to write about this? Mm. Cause it, it, it hasn't been discussed before or like I have to have a podcast like this because no, it's not happening enough huh. or you, you get what I'm saying? Like, it's like time taking away time from our lives. I mean, not like I'm, I love doing this podcast in the way that you love writing your yeah. book, but it, it is like, it is something that we have to focus on, you know, and be kind of active in it. You know, you get where yeah, I'm going yeah, with this? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think like there's this question of, a question I get sometimes about disability gain, like the idea that like disability might have something positive to offer as an experience. And I think non-disabled people have a lot of, and a lot of disabled people have a lot of trouble with this idea that's like, you know, back to the sort of medical model, right? Like it's, it's not gain. There's nothing to gain. It's like, I'm losing my vision. I have to do things 
you know, it's going to make life infinitely more inconvenient and, and I'm becoming marginalized and I have to deal, you know, I become that outlier. Right. Like, but, but there are aspects of the disabled experience that I do think are really positive in ways that like non-disabled people don't have access to. And like one of them is, is, is community. One of them I think is that like widening of the aperture of compassion that we were talking about. Um, and one of them I think is like, as you know, a, 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 an, an expanded perspective, you know, or like not even expanded perspective, but like a really, um, a really specific perspective that uh, feels different than, than anything that existed in my life before. And so when I think about like your question of, am I frustrated or resentful that like I had to write this book instead of writing the like sexy sci-fi space opera about cats that I would have been yeah. preferring to write. Like, <laughs> No, because this book I just found in this experience just was so rich and mind expanding that like, you know, this is something that blindness has given me is, um, is this path to explore and like a path that I never would have thought about otherwise, but that is like incredibly complicated and confusing and surprising and funny and rich. And so I'm grateful to, yeah, to my, uh, fucked up DNA for leading me here. Yeah. It's a weird thing. I I feel the same way about my podcast where, you know, um, sometimes I'm like, I, sometimes I actually like RP. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) You know, and that, and that's, and that's great. You have to, you know, I don't know. Yeah. You have to, you have, yeah, I agree. I mean, there's like a, a Buddhist teacher that I was into when I was a teenager named Chogyam Trungpa. I think he's since been canceled because he did some bad stuff. I don't know. But um, like he talked about like the bad stuff in your life being like manure that you like can use to like cultivate a garden. Oh, I like that. And and I feel like it's absolutely that, right? Where it's like, there's no question this is shit, right? Like it's it's 100% manure, like that you are not able to see the world the way you used to and that that's just going to keep getting worse. Like no getting around it that is the thing that comes out of the horse's ass. But the reality is like, you can use that to like grow the delicious vegetables that nourish you, you know, and grow beautiful flowers and grow the garden. And I just think that's so true and so powerful. And of course it's true, not just of disability, but anything that like you encounter as an obstacle or a constraint, like there are some things that are terrible and injustices and tragedies, but like it's, this is not necessarily always going to be one of them. Yeah, I agree completely. And that, that's a good quote. I'm a, write that down. I have like a list of quotes and mm. I just kind of add to my list and every now and then I'll just read the whole list and it'll just kind of help me like re rewire myself and get back to mm. a, a good frame of mind. But I think that's a good point to end on. I think that's a good summary of everything. Yeah. And, uh, I, I encourage everyone to go buy Andrew's book. It's, it truly is great. Um, and, uh, we, we covered some, some, broader topics, but I think the way, you know, Andrew specifically writes and, and puts it down in writing, I think is very unique and there's no other book out there like it, you know, that, that I've found in the, in the sense of that, especially if you, if you're, you're going through vision loss, it'll, you'll feel like he's inside of your head and it'll be fun. You're like, Oh, I thought that before. Okay. I'm not, I'm not like, losing my mind you know i i you know i feel it helps me feel understood and i also appreciate on that note andrew i appreciate your taking the time to talk to me today um and going so deep as we did in a certain topic i had no idea that we would venture into some of the topics we went into and uh sometimes you know in this these days where it's like you're getting into these kind of really hot topics it can be it can feel like you're uh walking the tightrope mm. a little bit so i appreciate you walking that tightrope with me and kind of pushing back even and, and and going back and forth with me on on everything um but uh i want to give you a chance to you know tell people where they can find your book and whatnot um man thank you so much for the kind words about uh, your experience of reading it uh i've gotten a couple of notes from from folks with rp who have said something similar and that's like you know, I'm psyched about the review in the New York Times or whatever, but like actual, yeah. actual people, actual blind people, actual people with RP, like feeling like it's legit. That means the most. Um, um, it, it's my favorite, my favorite um, piece of art about RP that I've 
took hell me. yeah thank you that's yeah. uh, that's going on my wall when i need to and to, i and i mean that <laughs> i really appreciate that lance uh that makes my makes my day uh as far as where you can find it um yeah i mean it's in go to your local independent bookstore um they have large print editions that you could find probably you want to order that uh request it from your library if you are an audiobook person, I recorded the audiobook myself, so you can hear my intrusive thoughts entering your head. Uh, <laughs> that way, you know, on Audible or Libro.fm is a good uh, place to get audiobooks. If you are a blind reader, it's on Bookshare, uh, which I highly recommend. Uh, if you don't know about Bookshare and you are legally blind, great, great source. Um, you're through your local blindness commission. You should be able to sign up. Um, and I, and Bard is another one of those things that you got to be blind to access it. Um, and I don't think it's on Bard yet, but I think it should be, you know, within the next month or two. Um, but yeah, all the, all the awesome. usual channels for books and my website is andrewleland.org and I'm on, on the internet as Quailty, Q-U-A-I-L-T-Y, which is a terrible handle cause it's hard to, it's, <laughs> people misspell it as quality but anyway, but you know, I'm trying to write more about disability so you can sign up for my sub stack on my website or just follow my brain to see where I go next. Cool. And I'll make it easy for everyone. If you just want to click in the description of the episode, I'll have a link there to, to the book, sweet the country of the blind. So just click there, show support. Um, and it even it's for everyone, the books for everyone. And it, if you're, if you have a loved one with RP, it's, I still recommend it because it's just going to give you a lot of insight into, you know, our world and just blind people's world as a whole. So thank you so much, Lance. Yeah. I think that wraps it all up. You know, it's an hour and a half of talk. Like I could have easily went three hours with you. <laughs> Me too. Um, totally. I feel I have this long list of questions and I think I, I asked you maybe one of them. <laughs> just, everything just kind of happened. Um, that's the sign of a good conversation. I think that's good though. Yeah. I think, I think if I was having to like source my questions, it means that there's a lot of dead silence. Yeah. And so, uh, but anyways, man, I'm really appreciative of your time. Thanks again for coming on and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. My pleasure. You too, Lance. Thanks.